the uh, subcommittee will come to order, we will uh, now pick up with Ms. Williams' uh, testimony. You recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Clay and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to participate in this hearing on the reauthorization of funding for the National Historical Publications and Records Commission. I've been the executive director of the commission since April 2008, and prior to that I served as deputy executive director for four years. During this time, I've had the privilege of overseeing a federal grant-making agency that plays a unique and valuable role in helping Americans access their historical records and that leverages its resources to maximum advantage. Grantees each year develop and implement dozens of projects to publish, preserve, and make known the nation's most important collections of archives and personal papers to scholars, researchers, teachers, and ordinary citizens in every corner of America. Since 1964, the Commission has funded approximately 4,800 projects across the country. These projects, in turn, have laid the groundwork for countless venues that increase our understanding of the American story and reach millions of Americans, including classroom use of historical documents in schools, public exhibitions at historical societies and museums, prize-winning biographies of the Founding Fathers and other notable Americans, television series on the Civil War, John Adams, and numerous other topics, and new digitized collections that document such varied subjects as the history of the Florida Everglades and the work of noted conservationist Aldo Leopold. Through our grants programs, we're able to leverage funds from private and public resources to augment the federal dollars we invest. In addition, the majority of commission grants support jobs that move these projects forward. In the panels this afternoon, you'll learn about the work of historians, documentary editors, and archivists, and the catalytic role the Commission plays in advancing that work for public benefit. You'll learn about the thousands of repositories across the country that struggle with caring for and providing access to the nation's historical records. Over the next five years, the Commission seeks to address several critical needs through its programs. First, one of the Commission's cornerstone grants programs is in publishing historical records, which supports projects that transcribe, annotate, and publish the historical records that document the American story, including the founding era, the modern presidency, the civil rights movement, and more. To date, we have supported some 300 projects, a body of work that tells the nation's remarkable history in the words of those who made that history. In the internet age, digital editions have become vital tools for both preserving and making accessible primary source materials. In the years ahead, we should ensure historians and editors the opportunity to creatively adapt to the advantages of online publishing. Secondly, the archives field must address several challenges in dealing with the numerous backlog of unprocessed records and providing online access to collections. Over the past few years, the Commission has spearheaded new grant opportunities, implementing approaches to archival work that address the hidden collections of historical documents to eliminate these backlogs and rapidly get these historical collections known and available to the public. We also are funding projects to digitize entire collections of historical records and put them online using cost-effective methods and a streamlined approach. Institutions ranging from Princeton to the Denver Public Library are rapidly changing their approaches to archival cataloging and preservation and providing online access to substantial collections through our grants. Thirdly, at present, the NHPRC supports state historical records advisory boards with grants to develop statewide services and training and archives, as well as offering effective grant programs. The vast majority of state boards actively partner with the Commission in these vital efforts. In Missouri, for example, our partnership with the State Board recently helped support a regrant program for 14 projects across that state, including the Archives of Historic Boonville, the Jewish Federation of St. Louis, and the Architectural Archives at the St. Joseph Museums. The Commission stands ready to do more of this kind of work to strengthen historical records preservation and use. And finally, we're eager to, eager to develop a targeted grants program that focuses on improving access to the nation's records of servitude and emancipation. These documents are often extremely difficult to find and use, but they're critical resources for anyone doing genealogical and other historical research. The National Archives serves as a hub for the nation's archives, and the NHPRC is a key part of that process. The Commission looks forward to serving as a true and effective federal partner in preserving and facilitating access to the nation's historical records. 
Thank you again for this opportunity to discuss the Commission with the Committee, and I look forward to answering your questions about the NHPRC and its work. Thank you, Ms. Williams, for your testimony. And now we'll go to the uh, questioning period. Uh, I'll start with uh, Archivist Ferriero. Uh, as Chairman of the Commission, uh, can you please explain how the NHPRC is unique among all grant makers supporting programs in history, archives, and the humanities? I think. Um Having been a recipient of uh, grants from both IMLS and NEH, um, I, can, I can speak to, to that. And now, um, having um, chaired two me meetings of the, of the commission, we are focused, the NHPRC is focused on records, historical records. IMLS doesn't um, deal with archives. Um, they, the L is for libraries, the M is for museums, and archives fall outside of, of their funding responsibilities. And NEH is um, focused on the humanities, um, not focused on records. Um, and I think that's what distinguishes the NHPRC program. Okay. Thanks for, for that response. And um, why should the federal government be interested in helping state and local archives and archivists preserve and make available non federal records? I think um, my message in, in my testimony is about telling the American story, and the ability to tell that American story is larger than federal records. Uh, I have, uh, under my purview, 10 billion items, um, but there are as many as that outside of, of my purview that are documents that uh, tell the American story. Thank you for your response. Ms. Williams, what specifically would an increased authorized funding level mean for the Commission and its future grant recipients? Well, I think it uh, would mean a couple of things, Mr. Chairman. I think it would help us to uh, improve already existing programs and expand those. In particular, um, digitizing uh, historical records really speaks to me and I think a lot of um, the rest of the citizen really in terms of direct access to these historical records. So I think we would certainly look to expand that. I think we would also look to um, use any increase to uh, in effect enhance um, publishing projects to really take on the challenge of um, working and producing online publications and that that is uh, an investment that is a wise investment again for the American people that we're very eager to do. We do some of it now um, but I think that there's some investment we could do with that. I think in my testimony just now I also indicated to you uh, we're very eager to take on specific uh, types of records, topical types, uh, records of servitude and emancipation. I think the Congress itself um, has asked us to um, see how we can accommodate that um, and move a, such a new program forward. And I think we're very eager at the Commission to, to take that on. That's just a couple of examples and, that and, I can provide and, you with. And that increased funding would help you assemble those records and enhance that effort, I'm sure. That's, that's correct. I think it's also um, one of the most effective programs we have is in dealing with the states and the state boards. And um, we're able to do some of that now, to, I think, to a great result. But um, increased funding will let us put more of that, uh, that funding out there. And how do uh, NHPRC grants translate into jobs? Well, interestingly, I think a lot of the work that we support with historical records, it's very core work and it's very labor intensive. So as a result, the bulk of the money that we award goes to either in the publishing or, or in uh, providing access and preserving, goes towards basically uh, jobs um, to carry out the work. Um, it's uh, simply uh, this past year, for example, the Commission's awarded about 120 grants. Um, and of that, about twice that amount um, uh, in terms of jobs that uh, are funded fully or or in part from this. This is jobs for historians, archivists, um, those doing digitization work. Can you uh, briefly describe the National Network of State Historic Advisory Boards and how that is crucial to the work of the NHPRC? 
Certainly. Um, the state boards, every state, uh, virtually every state has a board and the territories as well. And we at the Commission have been partnering, we feel very effectively with those boards for over 30 years in trying to provide them with the means to do statewide planning, provide statewide services, um, and issue what we call re-grants. This is basically um, the states having the ability to, based on their assessments of needs in their state, not us dictating in Washington how to spend it, but based on what they know the needs are in their state, whether it's training, preservation, digitization, they then issue that money out to smaller, modest and smaller repositories to, uh, to take care of those needs. So for us, that's a, a actually critical partnership in order to get the federal money out into local communities. Okay. Thank you for your response, Representative Chaffetz. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Look, the, uh, the uh, National Archives and Records Administration has given hundreds of millions of dollars of the people's money in order to, to, to fulfill a, a most definite need and service. And I appreciate the, the work that, that, that you do. Just yesterday, Chief of Staff Rahm Emanuel highlighted that the administration has proposed a three-year freeze in non-security discretionary funding and signed off on a directive to have a target of a 5% uh, constitute at least a 5% uh, uh, identify at least 5% that can be cut out of the budget. What are you proposing to cut out of your budget and why would you support doubling of the grant program? I got those instructions yesterday afternoon. I've seen them for the first time. Um, we'll launch a process to identify the areas in our administration, in our agency, where we're going to be making those cuts. The budget that is waiting approval right now for fiscal um, 11 already is a $10 million reduction in NARA's budget. Um, we, uh, we will be analyzing every piece of our legislation. I hope you can understand and appreciate by why, some of, why some of us look at this and say the proposal in the bill is to double the funding. You're already starting to cut some. The White House is trying to cut some. The Republicans through UCOT are trying to cut some. And that's why we, we have a, a bit of a disagreement. One of the, uh, the mission statement, we printed off the uh, U.S. National Archives and Records Administration mission statement. I want to read the first part of that. The National Archives and Records Administration serves American democracy by safeguarding, safeguarding and preserving the records of our government. I'm struggling to find through the grant process how you're justifying funding some of these programs that are not the records of our government. Because we can't preserve everything. We can't be all things to all people. Do you, uh, Ms. Williams, do you, do you have in your own mind a definition that separates the records of our government versus other projects that may feel like they're worthy of preserve, uh, preservation. You're asking for a definition that separates that, or just well, let my? Let me give you an example. Let me, let me give you an example. Princeton University, a pretty wealthy institution, received $122,848 to process 1,965 linear feet of records for the ACLU. I struggle to find the federal nexus and the national imperative to help the ACL, ACLU preserve some of its records. Well, maybe it would uh, uh, help if I can suggest how, uh, how this process works so you have a better understanding but of it. But do you exclude, let me ask real direct, my time's so short, I'm sorry. Do you dismiss grant applicants based on the, is there a litmus test that says, this is government, this isn't. If you're not government, sorry, you're going to have to scoot over and we're not going to consider it. Can you I, don't dismiss anybody if they're, if they're outside the government. Can I respond government. to that? Yeah, sure, sure. Congress established NHPRC in 1934 mm -hmm. to deal with the non-federal records. This was an effort to get the National Archives to exert some leadership in the country with non-federal records. It's a grant program focused on states and local communities universities where there are historical you can, records. You can see where there's, to, when you look at the mission statement of the overall, what you're trying to accomplish with the National Archives. Well, let me give you another example and help me understand how you can justify in Wilmington, Delaware, and I'm going to slaughter this name, a Lutheran Mills Hagley Foundation, $112,203 to process and make available the papers of an interior designer 
William Pauman, a leader in department and specialty store design. It's just, can you understand why we're with 13 trillion dollars in debt that a lot of people would look at that particular one and say, that's what they're doing with our federal dollars? How do we justify that? Why is that a good program? Well, if I could go back again to kind of the process, because we don't um, sit in Washington and uh, simply based on uh, personal interest or anything else make these sorts of decisions. The, the grant process uh, is a, a rigorous one, the review process. And so we get a pool of applicants every grant cycle from all across the country. And, we, and roughly how much money are you, is requested overall? I mean, you give out $10 million, so how much, do you know offhand how much was requested? This, this past year, almost $23 million was requested. So more than, and I've got to do my math, 45% of the people actually get a grant? About 46% received, has received a grant thus far this year. I see my time's expired. I got more questions, though. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me, let me also note for the record that, you know, uh, Representative, this is the process. Um, this bill, uh, H.R. 1556, will only authorize. The money would still have to be appropriated. This is the process that we use here. Uh, and, and I just want to note that for the record. Also, when you talk about um, records, um, be they federal or private records, you know, I, as she mentioned, servitude and emancipation records, I think, are federal records. A Freedmen's Bureau was set up after the Civil War. That was a federal function. Uh, we sanctioned slavery in this country. Uh, that was a federal function, and, and, and they had the great debates around slavery. I, th I think it's consistent with us knowing our history that, uh, that we try to preserve those records and, and try to uh, make that knowledge available uh, in, a, in, a, in a countrywide effort. Uh, that's my editorial, and I'll stop here and recognize Mr. Jordan for questioning. Thank the chairman. And, uh not as familiar with the subject matter as, as the chairman and the ranking member, but I'll have a, have a few questions. If I have enough time, I'll, I'll, I'll yield back to our, uh, to our, yield that time to our ranking member. Um, do both of you agree that we, we're, we're at a point in our nation uh, with our government where we need, to, we need to reduce spending and begin to get a handle on, not, not just your program, but overall the, 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 the budget? Would you both agree with that statement? I agree. I do. You're familiar with the numbers that the ranking member has been talking about, $1.4 trillion deficit, $13 trillion national debt. Within a couple of years, within two years, we will be paying more than a billion dollars a day just on interest, just to service the debt. And that's, that's just even assuming that the interest rates stay low, which they are right now, relatively low. Uh, you're, you're familiar with all those, those uh, numbers. Let me, um, let me ask a question. I, I think Congressman uh, Larson, when he, was, when he was talking earlier, talked about the, uh, the um, maybe it was the ranking member, uh, the, the overall budgets for archives, humanities, and Library of Congress, close to $900 million, is that right? 870, what's, 874 uh, million dollars. And um, the charge from the administration uh, yesterday was to begin to look at agencies, figure out where there's redundancy, potential waste, uh, programs that aren't effective. Is there any, in your judgment, is there any uh, any potential redundancy in those three, um, with those three budgets? In that, do you think maybe there could we could find some places where the archives are doing some of the same things that the Library of Congress is doing, the humanities are doing? Uh, do do we know of that? I think the figure that was cited for the archive was the entire archives budget, not NHPRC, mm -hmm. and the NHPRC piece is ten million dollars. So, so you're comparing ten million. NEH and IMLS. So I guess my question is broader. I mean, just as, as an expert in this area, and, and do you think that in those three respect, the, the Archives, Library of Congress, and, and, and uh, uh, Department of Humanities, do you think there are... Duplication? Yeah. I don't think so. You don't think so at all? I don't think so. You think the taxpayers would, would, would accept that, just a general statement? Do you think no duplication? Yes. Okay. okay. The gentleman to yield for a second. You have to yield. The Part of the problem here is one of the funding uh, a applications that happened in February of 2009 was for the International Tennis Hall of Fame. 
how can we do that? How can look anybody into, and, and I, I recognize it doesn't come under your direct purview, but how can anybody look the American taxpayers in the eye and say, I know you're struggling, but we got to get money to that international tennis hall of fame. That's what's so infuriating about this. It's not because we're trying to do this for the civil rights movement. I would support that, but far from it. The goodwill for a computer museum, for goodness sake, to make sure that we, we make an allocation for vintage computers, that's the difference. It's not the emotion and, and the need, the federal nexus for the civil rights movement. It's about the International Tennis Foundation, the ACLU, Stanford University, Princeton. We're pulling people's money out of their pockets and we're giving it to somebody else. That's not the proper role of government to be doing this at the federal level. My apologies, I'll yield back <laughs> to you. No, no, I think the gentleman, I think, I think he makes, makes a great point. Here's, I guess, the, the, in kind of a broad context. Um, you know, we always look at programs that are important and I, we understand that, but in tough economic times, you have to do, you have to make tough decisions. I, I, I think uh, an example that comes to mind is our, our local school district. My wife teaches, she's part-time teacher there, local school district. Uh, two months ago, front page of our local paper, they're talking about cutbacks they're going to have to make. And, um, you know, my experience, I, re I read through the whole thing. And our kids go to that school, my wife and I went to that school. We think it's a nice little local school. But I, I read through it all. And once you look at what they're planning to do, the question that came to mind was, well, why in the heck weren't we already doing this? And, and that's what we're asking. I mean, there Go through, look at, make those decisions, look at where there potentially is redundancy, potentially, you know, wasteful we'll thing, and make those tough calls. That's what we're asking, not to increase the budget, get by on what all kinds of taxpayers, all kinds of families, all kinds of small business owners are getting by on last year's budget. In many cases, something less than last year's budget. Why in the heck can't government, in particular, the federal government, do the same? And when you couple that with what the ranking members pointed out, some of these grant recipients and where some of these taxpayer dollars are uh, some of these taxpayer dollars are going i think it just add, adds weight to our argument that's the point we're making and with that i would yield back my remaining 20 seconds to the to the ranking member <laughs> or, or to yield back to the chairman thanks okay <laughs> i thank the gentleman for yielding back just for the record uh, for my colleagues the uh, national Endowment for the Humanities and the Institute for Museums and Library Services do not duplicate any NHPRC programs. Um, that's just for, for, for your knowledge. They do not duplicate those programs. Uh, if there are no further questions. I, I'd like another panel, round if I could. We, I got the right to do it twice, uh, I we, believe. We got two other panels. I don't. Again. I w I'm sure you have enough ammunition. I, I'd like to respond, I guess, to... Well, go ahead and respond. I, I, again, I'm new to this process. I'm a freshman here. I, but I, perhaps that perspective is a good one because I still am struggling to understand why there's not a duplication. Because I see that the imperative that you put out in your mission statement is the preservation of the records of our government. And consistently, I see that... Give, let me give you another example. That happened through the NHPRC. Uh, uh, the Norman Rockwell Museum at Stockbridge, uh, Massachusetts, $108,000 to process and make available approximately two, 725 cubic feet of material on American artist Norman Rockwell and, tw and 20th century American artists. I, I, I just, I, I fail to understand why that wouldn't fall under humanities or some other issue. Let me give you another one. Stanford University, $111,000 plus dollars to arrange and describe unprocessed materials from 88 collections within its archive of records, sound of spoken word, and recordings of music. I mean, we could keep going on and on, but this is the kind of stuff that's infuriating. In times of tough budgets, we've got to find a way to consolidate and make some cuts. What's been on the table is a doubling of a budget. That's why I think we see so, much, so many people just fired up about this. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome, Representative. Norman Rockwell, the great American artist, probably deserves to have something preserved in our history. Uh, let me ask Ms. Williams if you'd like to respond to anything you've heard. Well, I think that the part of our emphasis at the Commission is to invite applications for funding to support preservation and access to the nation's historical records. 
uh, wherever they reside in a great variety, a great variety of records. Um, and I think some of the, the members of the subcommittee have pointed out some that they find um, perhaps uh, not worthy in their eyes. I just want to re-emphasize that these proposals all go through a very rigorous vetting process by peer reviewers, state boards, the full commission, um, and staff. Um, and that uh, those um, uh, review, that review process, I think, brings the, um, the heavy weight of analysis to these uh, proposals, um, and they're used uh, extensively in making these sorts of decisions. So um, I, I think it's, a, it's documenting for us at the commission the American story. Um, which goes beyond federal records. Um, that's the mission of the commission. It's been its mission since it was created in 1934. Thank you so much. Uh, at this point, this panel is excused, and uh, I'd now like to invite our second panel witnesses.